Now for today's program. Dan Glickman is a former vice president of the Aspen Institute, a senior fellow at the Bipartisan Policy Center and a board member of the World Food Program USA. He served for 18 years in the U.S. House of Representatives, representing the 4th Congressional District of Kansas, as well as serving as the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture from 1995 to 2001, and as Chairman of the Motion Picture Association of America from 2004 to 2010. Dan is the author of the recently released book, Laughing at Myself, My Education in Congress on the Farm and at the Movies. Jonathan Glickman is a seasoned veteran of over 25 years in the entertainment business. He founded the Glickmania Media Group, an independent production company in February 2020. Prior to Glickmania, Jonathan had a successful eight-year run as president of the MGM Motion Picture Group, where he guided a bankrupt company into a thriving studio. Jonathan began his career at Caravan Pictures before moving on to become the president of Spyglass Entertainment. Outside of the studio, Jonathan serves on the National Board of the Posse Foundation and Story Pirates. In 2014, Jonathan started the Visiting Producer Series Endowment Fund in the Department of Screen Arts and Cultures at the University of Michigan. Please welcome Secretary Dan Glickman and Jonathan Glickman. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, Mr. Secretary, is it okay if I call you dad during this interview? Yes, uh, finally, after all these years, you can call okay. me dad. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure they don't realize that we have to, I have to address you, our whole family addresses you as Mr. Secretary at home, mm -hmm. um, even Mr. Secretary Grandpa. So um, first of all, I think the book is a fantastic education, even for myself, of what it's like to grow up in a uh, the Midwest as in a Jewish family, but I don't know if you have the same uh, experience that I have, which is probably the most common reaction to when I tell people I'm from Wichita is, how did a Jewish family make it to Wichita? Um, are you asked that question as often as I am? And for the benefit of the audience, can you explain how this happened? Well, I tell people, first of all, that your great grandfather and my grandfather, they got there because they took the train from Chicago. So that's how they got to Wichita. But, uh, but uh, you know, like most uh, immigrants from Eastern Europe, my grandparents came from, uh, my grandfather came from Belarus near Minsk. My grandmother came from somewhere in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, I'm not sure whose border it was when, when, when she actually left. And one of them had a cousin in Kansas City. And the other one was told that he ought to go to Kansas because he would be uh, productive and he had some long lost relatives there and they ended up in Wichita, Kansas, uh, you know, around 1915 and right before the First World War and got started, went into the scrap iron business and the rest is history. And then the, they had a family, had two sons, had grandchildren and, you know, and it was, and Wichita was a town of about, then about 100,000 people, but always had about 200 Jewish families and always had two synagogues. You never had one synagogue, that was for sure, because you always had the, had to have the synagogue that nobody would go to. So we were in the one that everybody went to. Um, that's funny. Now, 200 families is not a lot of Jewish families. I'm curious when you grew up, um, did your, was your circle of friends and your social world and your parents based around that community or was it around the city at large? I'd say it was both. Uh, so, you know, there are only maybe five or six Jewish kids in my high school. And uh, so, you know, I had friends uh, in the general non-Jewish community. I was on the golf team at Southeast High School. I was the only Jewish kid on the golf team, that was for sure. Although I wasn't such a great golfer, but, but I still managed to get on the team. But I was also active in AZA, BB, the neighbor youth organization. And, and uh, you know, we had a we had a Jewish life as well and a lot of Jewish friends and but it wasn't exclusively Jewish it wasn't large enough to be like that and plus our your grandparents my parents were very active in the community as a whole your grandfather as you know owned the AAA baseball team in Wichita and was uh, active in community affairs also and did you face any anti-Semitism growing up or was it sort of a non-factor that you were Jewish? I'd say it was generally a non-factor. Uh, you know, when I got into Congress, periodically, uh, you know, I might get an anonymous letter or two um, that, that would refer to my religion. 
but um, uh, I made it a point to always reach out. And then, of course, I was involved in agriculture, which was not a typical Jewish industry, particularly farming wasn't. There were a lot of Jewish people in the food business, but not so much in production agriculture. And uh, I think that helped me. Once, once people saw me and they saw that I was just like anybody else and could talk about the issues they cared about, they were more interested in get, getting their farm program payments through than they were on what religion I was. I recall I did have one woman once tell me, she says, well, you know, Mr. Glickman, I think you're probably going to go to hell, but I'm still going to vote for you because you didn't get a favor on Social Security. So I learned that politics stopped at the water's edge when it came to all of these programs. Um, so, well, I, to, to specify that comment a little bit, I know that um, you certainly were brought up culturally Jewish because I, I, knowing grandma and grandpa, your parents, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's important. This book is called Laughing at Myself. It's about humor and um, self-deprecation. And there is certainly, I think, a Jewish vaudevillian sense of humor that ran inside of that house. And I'm wondering if you felt that you needed to be funny in order to fit in in Wichita as, as somewhat of an outsider. Well, uh, first of all, your grandparents, my parents, were both had this tremendous sense of humor. It just, it was natural. It came with them. You know, my, in fact, my grandfather used to make the joke. They asked him, they said, well, he, how did you get to Kansas? Weren't you one of the first settlers? And he said, yeah, I was one of the first settlers in Kansas. I settled for 10 cents on the dollar. And so it was this kind of natural wit. And my father was the Rodney Dangerfield, Henny Youngman type of humor, lots of jokes, one-liners all the time. And my mother was also very funny, a more authentic, natural, not so much. She was more situational humor. And it was just part of their uh, gestalt, I would say. Not, not everybody was like that. We also had our fair amount of acrimony in our house, too. So there was a lot of laughter and there was also a lot of screaming. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think that's continued on. <laughs> oh. um. How important was uh, politics at the dinner table? Did you discuss politics? Is that why you wanted to become a politician? What were the roots of your interest in politics in Kansas? You know, I, I, my parents were not particularly politically active. They were, they were both registered Republicans because Kansas was always one of the most Republican states, but it was a different kind of Republicanism than what you see right now. They were kind of moderates and, and, um, um, my dad and mother supported both Democrats and Republicans. It was, it, they, were, they weren't ideological uh, at all. And I'd say my, my interest in politics, I don't know. I was president of the sixth grade at Fabrique Elementary School in Wichita. Maybe that's where it got started or I was election. Yeah, but, but anyway, it wasn't because of any great ideology. It may have been because I was a middle child and I found that I always wanted to prevent conflict and bring people together and solve problems, that kind of thing. Who knows? Well, I do think it's worth mentioning. It's in the book, which, by the way, should be linked up in somewhere on the main screen. And please buy one, buy 10, buy 25. The My, future of our family depends on these it, books being it, sold. It, so let's make yeah, some in product fact, today. In fact, um, my grandson's starting college next year and the tuition hasn't been paid yet, right? Please, please. Um, but... Um, you know, there's a story where you had an encounter with an important politician early in life. Um, and I think it's worth talking about that, uh, the, when you and your father drove somebody uh, across the state of Kansas. Yeah, well, you know, my dad then set some sort of spark. Yeah, you know, my dad uh, was, uh, was president of the local UJA, Mid-Kansas Jewish Welfare Federation, active in B'nai B'rith, too. So he had, he had his Jewish uh, activities. And so... One year, uh, Harry Truman, the former president, uh, lived in Independence, Missouri, but it wasn't too far from Wichita, just outside of Kansas City. And he spoke at a bond dinner, an Israel bond dinner. And, and you know, listen, he was the president of the United States and he didn't have transportation to come to Wichita. Remember, he left Washington with nothing. And it was only when he wrote his biography that it was called Mr. Citizen, that he made enough money to kind of he lived with his mother in their house in Independence. So we picked him up, my dad and I, and I think my brother was in the car. Uh, a Missouri Highway Patrolman drove him to the Kansas border. Uh, then we drove him to Wichita 
and this was before they had a turnpike there. And so we spent about four hours in the car with Harry Truman, just the three of us. And we were, I remember we talked about a lot of things. We talked about Israel and, you know, why he was involved in the formation of the state of Israel and his business partner, Eddie Jacobson, they ran a haberdashery shop together, which failed actually. And he talked about uh, Richard Nixon. I'll never forget, he says, you gotta watch that guy. I'm not, I'm not too sure about him. He, he, uh, we asked him about Eisenhower and he, he had nothing really to say, good or bad. But I just remember this conversation. Then we drove him back. And, um, you know, and, and it turns out, you know, I remember that fondly even to this day. And I still think that Harry Truman was one of our really great presidents. And I always say that he had the perfect name, true man. And, you know, just like, uh, uh, not, not like any of the presidents we've had since that time. He, he did not bask in the glories of the office. He was really a common man. Yeah, um, we're going to get to that later because it's interesting you say he left without a lot of money, um, but we'll, we'll get to that. First, let's talk a little bit about, so you left uh, Wichita, you went to the University of Michigan, where most importantly, you met um, somebody who uh, you fell in love with and I think is a very instrumental person in your career, uh, Rhoda Ura. Yes. Um, and I'm curious for during your tenure at Michigan, you know, Tom Hayden was there with the SDS and it was the beginning of some very volatile times and some political unrest and changes in the 60s. How much were you part of that world and that scene at Michigan? Well, first of all, Rhoda Ura became Rhoda Glickman, who uh, after 55, almost 55 years, we're, we're, we're we're still married and is, of course is your mother so you have a, a, a product of that uh, kind of uh, relationship and so does your sister amy um but um michigan and berkeley were the two schools that were the and maybe columbia uh, were the three schools that were just the heart of the vietnam war protest movement and tom hayden uh jane fonda's ex-husband was very involved in Michigan and for the Students for Democratic Society and started a lot of the anti-war protests. I was not extremely involved in this. I was, uh, I, 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 I suppose I was what you call in a secular way anti-war, but not visual and not active in the, in the anti-war movement. Uh, but then um, people started getting drafted around 1965, 66, and I graduated in 66 and and uh, got married that year. And I remember your grandfather said to me, he says, uh, he was very anti-war. And he said, I want you to get married. And, and I said, well, we are gonna get married in August. And he said, well, then I want you to have a baby. I said, when? He says, before you get married, it's okay with me <laughs> because you could get a deferment back then. And that was almost like political heresy to talk like that, but, uh, but we didn't have you before then. I want everybody to know that you were born after we got married. Thank God. Um, so, um, well, it's interesting you say that you weren't really part of the political unrest. In fact, I think that your party registration when you were at Michigan was not as a Democrat. You were a Republican, am I right? I, I, yeah, I think I was a Republican. I was certainly what my parents were and the Democratic Party in Kansas was always very weak. We're the longest running state in the country that has not elected a Democratic senator. And the last one was in 1932. So I was probably what you call an agnostic Republican. And I was that way and pretty much until the early to mid 1970s. So the, the war had an impact on me, but I was not engaged in it actively. Um, I do think that it, to be clear, you were interested in politics. You went to George Washington yeah. uh, Law School and you worked for politicians when you were there in a congressman. And I believe that you had a key meeting with the senator from Kansas who sort of that conversation guided the future of your career. Can you, can you tell the um, audience who that person is and also um, the idea that he became a mentor of yours, I think for the rest of your career in a very odd way. Yes, yeah, so this uh, actually occurred once I finished law school, I worked for the government for a while and I went back to Kansas. And by the way, even at Michigan, I was involved in what I call secular po politics. I was uh, uh, president of the senior class of the liberal arts college at Michigan. 
And I was also involved in an organization called Michigan Students for Romney and Johnson. Hmm. So it showed you I was, I'd split my loyalties, George Romney, Mitt Romney's dad, and then Lyndon Johnson, uh, who was for president. We weren't for Goldwater, that was for sure. But anyway, so back to coming, when going back to Kansas after uh, law school, um, I decided, you know, I, I'd really like to go to work for a senator. So I went to see Bob Dole, who was then the junior senator from Kansas. And uh, we had a common friend, uh, Sam Marcus, who knew Bob Dole very well. And he got me a meeting with him. And Dole was very courteous. And I said, well, Senator, I'd really like to come back and work for you. And he said, yeah, I see a future budding politician right before me. And he says, I don't think you ought to go to work for me now. I think you ought to go back to Kansas and establish your roots before you start thinking about coming back to Washington. And, and I, of course, I think he thought I was going to be a Republican and maybe really go under his umbrella. Um, and it turned out that he became an interesting person, a, a longtime mentor to me. At the same time, we used to politically spar with each other. And many times I thought about running against him, which would have been suicide because he was, <laughs> he was un, unbeatable. And, and he's, he turned out to be, I just might say parenthetically, you talk about later in life, the kind of political leader in Congress that we don't have anymore because he was a guy who was sent there, he said, to get things done and to show leadership, and it doesn't really exist anymore. So even though we were of different political parties, we, we got along very well. So when you went back to Kansas, was it with the intent of running for office, or did you move back to Wichita just to you know see, practice law and watch some minor I, baseball? Yeah, I, <laughs> I think I went back because I thought that I needed to establish roots somewhere besides Washington. I think the pol politics was in my blood because after about two years, I decided to run for the Wichita, Kansas school board. And so that must have meant that politics was in my blood. So I ran for the school board. You were like four or five years old at the time, maybe a little older. This would no four or five because 1973. And uh, I won and became a member of the Wichita, Kansas school board and then became president of the school board. And that gave me a lot of visibility around the area because that was the largest school district in the state of Kansas. And that really became a springboard for running for higher office. And when you ran for office, you ran against an eight term incumbent named Garner Shriver, Republican. And I don't know, there are countless Democrats in the primary to run against him. I mean, it really was a one in a trillion shot. It was a, uh, it was such an underdog race. How important was the Jewish community in Wichita to you running your office, your campaign, as well as winning that race? It was really important. I mean, there weren't a lot of Jews around, but those that really helped me, the inner circle were almost all, all Jewish, except for my campaign manager who wasn't Jewish. She was my debate teacher in high school who became my uh, campaign manager. But your grandmother and a bunch of her friends were the phone callers and the phone bankers. And, um, and so I think the Jewish community, small as it was, was a really important part of my effort. And it turned out that my opponent, Garner Shriver, his chief of staff was Jewish. His name was Lester Rosen from Wichita. I used to date his niece and, mm -hmm. uh, and I ended up beating him. Um, you, and then in this race, um, we, it kind of, kind of uh, not, not as counterintuitive to what you would think would happen. You actually were able to beat um, Garner Shriver by winning in the rural and agriculture areas. And he was more successful in the urban areas, which is sort of the opposite of what we think of Democrat and Republican politics. I'm curious, how did you learn about agriculture enough to be able to convince these people to vote for you? I, I didn't know anything about agriculture other than once in a while, I mean, I'd met farmers because I worked for your grandfather in the scrap iron business. So a lot of farmers would bring in scrap and, and he would also go out in the field sometimes and I'd go with him. But um, I think my, I had this campaign manager and she said, I want you to focus 75% of your time in rural areas and only 25% of your time in the Wichita urban areas because she says, I think you can win this race if you can build up margins in the small towns and rural areas and farms. And so I just made it my specialty and I spent 
a huge amount of my time there. I talked about agriculture and farming. I had some good advisors. Uh, the Jewish issue never came up, uh, to be honest with you, at all in that campaign, as far as I'm aware. And um, the race was tight, but I won about 60% of the vote in the rural areas and 40% of the vote in the city of Wichita. Um, you say the Jewish issue never came up, but on election night, which was very tight, uh, I, I know the, the news covered the campaign op, uh, headquarters live and in which they showed what was what can you get, explain what was the celebration that was on live television in Wichita, Kansas? I, 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 I think my mother and her friends were dancing the Hora in Wichita yeah. on my uh, election night. And then the, one of the newspapers in Kansas said, I remember the exact words they said, it was a veritable political kibbutz at the Clinton <laughs> headquarters. Uh, and I'm not sure anybody understood what he said, but whatever. Um, so you, you went to Washington and this incredible class of congressmen in 96, both on the Republican and on the Democrat side. And um, in fact, I think on the Democrat sides, when they would sit you alphabetically, it would go Gephardt, Glickman, Gore. And so I know that um, those two relationships were critical to you, but you were also close with Republicans, I know, that came into that. Can you explain what the tenor of the House was when you first came in in 1977, I guess it would be? Yeah, yeah. So so I had we had a class of, I think there were 47 Democrats and 25 Republicans or so, but we operated pretty much as a class. The party differences weren't as is as great as they are right now. First place, the Democrats had been in the majority for a long time, and um, Republicans were in the clear minority. There was it was almost two to one uh, Democrats to Republicans, and so uh, there, there was a lot of camaraderie. And our spouses were there. You and I remember Amy were on the floor of the House when I was sworn in, and not, as opposed to today, where so many members of Congress don't live in Washington. Don't bring their spouses to Washington. They live in their home, their homes, and so people aren't as close as they used to be. So I was able to develop relationships not only with Al Gore, who later became vice president, or uh, Dick Gephardt, who became uh, chairman of the Democratic Caucus, but uh, Leon Panetta, who became White House chief of staff and head of the CIA and the Pentagon. He was in my class as well. Dan Quayle, a Republican, was in my class. He became vice president. Um, under uh, George H.W. Bush. And those relationships were great and we had a lot of fun and it was a, it was a much less partisan era. There's no question about it. And, and I think you particularly exemplified being bipartisan. Um, and I know that you voted on both sides and in, in, in certain uh, issues, but what I wanna ask is, you know, how important was your experience of being on the agriculture committee to um, creating a bipartisan, uh, you know, uh, interest behind your politics. The, bi the agriculture committee was critical in that. First of all, it was I was the most urban member of the agriculture committee, coming from Wichita, Kansas, which is still a small town compared to big cities in the East. And uh, it was very bipartisan. Republicans and Democrats worked across the aisle all the time. The committee had jurisdiction, not only under uh, farm programs, but also all the feeding programs. So the food stamp program, the school, national school lunch program, the women, infant, and children program. So we had both farm and poverty programs. And we were able to work coalitions building bridges between rural and urban America. It was very bipartisan and um, much less so than what we see today. And um, I know that you were very active when you came in. Uh, you passed a lot of amendments and, uh, and laws. Is, is there anything particular uh, before 1994, which we'll get to in a second, that you passed that you were proud of uh, and uh, you, you still think of today as a big accomplishment in Kansas. I mean, well, you know, I mean, first of all, lots of farm stuff that I worked on, but my hometown was also the home of the, it was the general aviation capital of the world. We were the headquarters of Beach, Cessna, Learjet, and the Boeing company had 30,000 employees in Wichita. So I worked a lot on, besides agriculture, on legislation affecting airplanes and airplane manufacturers. And that's been one of the loves of my life is the airplane industry, airplane schedules, and, and that very successful piece of legislation. 
Uh, although at some point, then it, when we get to 1994, after my 18 years in Congress, the voters in my district had other ideas about what my occupation ought to be. Um, and I do want to get to that. Um, and especially getting back to um, humor and, uh, and how you were able to use it to help persevere and create relationships. I know that there's a period of great adversity that you had in Congress. And I want you to talk about it a little bit, but also how you used humor to get yourself through it. So uh, my adversity, some folks on this call may remember years and years ago that the House of Representatives had a bank and we would bank, you know, checking accounts. And we often, it turned out, had overdrawn balances at the bank. And, but it was a cooperative. So let's say you were a house member and I was, and you had money in your account and at the end of the month I didn't. They would just take money from your account and put it in my account and they'd pay the bills. So there were actually never any bounce checks, but it became a big scandal. House of Representatives bounces checks. So majority of members uh, bounce checks. And there, there were technically never bounce checks, but they would have been classic overdrafts. And so it was a really hard time for me. And overnight, I turned from the most popular guy in the world in my district to the guy who bounced checks. So I had to figure a way to get out of this jam I was in, or I thought for sure I was going to lose. And, and I was invited to the local gridiron club, which is a club of the journalists run. And there are gridiron clubs all over the country. And your mom and I and one other person helped write a song to the tune of, of uh, Hey Big Spender from the show Sweet Charity. And it made fun of myself. I couldn't learn to add or subtract. I was not a crook like you know who was uh, in, in previous times. And it just, it, and, and then I performed it to a large enough crowd that it was, it was all over the media. And uh, after that, it taught me that the self-deprecating humor if you're genuine about it, can get you out of a out of a trouble, out of a jam. And then people started walking up to me on the street and they said, you know, I've bounced a few checks. It's really not so terrible. And um, so uh, I, I learned, it was before that too, but I learned that, uh, that self-deprecating humor, which we don't see today very much. In fact, most of our politicians are pretty humorless in today's modern world. Um, it, it helped me... Uh, uh, both in terms of leadership responsibilities, but it also helped me cope as well. Well, let's, let's just jump ahead a little bit and talk about that. Um, you don't see self-deprecating humor really in any of our politicians today. Um, and in fact, if you see anything, it seems like you see the opposite, which is, is it's more insult comedy or in, or in how um, humor is used. And I'm curious as to why you think that's the case. And do you think that it would, it would even work in today's atmosphere where people are so concerned about saying something that could potentially be misconstrued or make you appear as weak? Well, first of all, today, if you say something that's even moderately edgy, it will go on the uh, social media and the internet and be there till the end of time and can be drudged up and uh, used against you. And I think it's made people very, very cautious to, to be themselves. And uh, I think that's a factor that we haven't really uh, appreciated as much. And, and the nature of our media today, the nature of politics is, is that if you, if you even say something, not even that it's politically incorrect, because there are some things you just shouldn't say and shouldn't believe in, but, it, but even making fun of yourself may be viewed as uh, not a sign of strength at all. And uh, so that may be another factor as well. And, you know, I always say, if you look back at the presidents that have had the most impact, they're usually the ones that have had the best senses of humor. So it's Lincoln, FDR, Ronald Reagan, John Kennedy, and some of the others as well. But these are ones that have been known to either they, either they had good writers or they just had the natural inclination and wit to be able to make fun of themselves. And I think it made them better leaders. Yeah, and it's also interesting with the balance check uh, scandal or the, uh, the co-op, I won't say balance check anymore, rubber gate. But I think that um, people in today's world, it, it, it almost seems as if you can't admit any failings as a politician or a leader. And actually the key to success is sort of just to, to either not acknowledge it or to deny that anything bad has happened to you. 
Well, certainly we, we saw from our previous president, and again, I try not to be overly partisan, he never admitted doing anything wrong, ever. And uh, I think it, uh, it will have a lasting, just dark mark on his legacy, you know, that we would have a president like that. And, and now, fortunately, we have a president who I think has certainly got a much better tone, much more empathy, much more respectful. But um, I think it was tragic that, uh, that uh, he was a president who create, helped create an environment. I'm not saying it wasn't out there in the country uh, that encouraged some of this toxicity. I served under many presidents and everybody I served under from Carter to Reagan to uh, the Bushes uh, to, I didn't serve under Obama or Biden, but I would put them in this category. All had a good sense of self and we're all very decent people. And most of them had a reasonably good sense of humor. Um, I, you know, it's um, that, that actually- And I, meant, I didn't mention Clinton. I did, he was the one I did work for, so I should mention him. Um, well, um, speaking of humor in times of adversity and, and just sort of acknowledging your foibles, let's talk about 1994, because it's interesting. Uh, you know, Newt Gingrich came in who sort of led to this uh, period in time in which, uh, humor and bipartisanship sort of went down the drain. And uh, you ran, you had done more for the district probably in job creation than in the entire term, uh, period you had served up till then, and yet you lost. A, did you see that you were going to lose early in the election? Could you tell the tides were changing? And B, how did that loss affect you personally? Well, first of all, I, I really didn't see it until about three weeks or four weeks before, because we did a poll in September around Labor Day and I was up two to one. And, you know, I had won nine previous elections. Although the, the election before this one, I had only won by 10 points, which today would be considered as great, but back then it was considered as tight. But then I, I could see things happening. Two things that hurt me. One is guns, uh, firearms. I voted for the uh, Brady Bill and the assault weapons ban. and in the heartland, particularly in rural areas and in working class areas, that was just a, a vote that was really, really problematic. And we can talk about why, but it, it, I was, it, it, it created a lot of uh, enemies from, of people who were my supporters in the past. And then the abortion issue became a huge issue in Wichita. It was, Wichita, Kansas was the headquarters of the Summer of Mercy, this national anti-abortion movement. And then the third thing was Bill Clinton wasn't all that popular and he had this national health care proposal. And so putting all those things together, and the Republicans did a very good job of messaging and they swept the Democrats, 60 or, or so of us out, and especially the moderates like me. We, the, the, the liberals were able to survive it, but the moderates were swept out. And so that happened to me, and it was uh, for about three days pretty depressing. But your grandfather, basically, who was from the old school and very tough, he said, "Get your act together. Don't feel sorry for yourself. Go out and and, and take and grab hold of the future." And that's what I did. And then um, I was lucky because I got a very good job within about four weeks. Yes, we'll get that. I want to remind everybody out there in the audience that. Uh, Please uh, put your questions in. I've already asked a couple that people have asked for. Um, but I do um, want to talk about the fact that you lost this election. And uh, unlike uh, other people, you, were able, you have this you know, knack of, of failing upward, I like to say. But I don't think that it's luck. I think that there are certain key relationships you had that um, allowed you to get in the position of getting the cabinet nomination. And I think you, if you can talk about that a little bit, um, how you used your, what, do you have a philosophy of like, hey, I'm gonna be nice to this person because you never know this person might help you or is there any sort of um, basically, you know, clever thinking that ever, you know, as you go along in politics, that you uh, sort of had a philosophy of dealing with other well, people? Well, first of all, I, I basically was not the kind to build walls. But, and so I tried never to burn bridges. And in anything I did, never have any permanent enemies, never. And so uh, when I lost the election and, you know, pretty likable guy, most people liked me and uh, been on the agriculture committee all these years. And the then secretary of agriculture, his name was Mike Espy, 
had announced he was resigning because of ethics charges that were filed against him. He was largely exonerated of those. But anyway, so Bill Clinton had lost the Congress, both houses, and had to pick as his, one of his first tasks a new Secretary of Agriculture. And he had to pick someone who the Republicans could support um, and uh, could get confirmed. And so I had a couple of pretty good allies. And one of my allies was the Senate Majority Leader, a Republican named Bob Dole. And then I had a second ally named Leon Panetta, who was the White House Chief of Staff for Bill Clinton. And I had a third ally, Al Gore, who was the Vice President of the United States. I mean, again, these are people who've been with me from way back and managed to um, keep good relationships with. So Clinton didn't know me very well. And uh, so the story is, is that uh, Clinton uh, said, I better go talk to Dole. I was asked to take this job, but he said, you better go talk to Dole. And of course, Clinton had already talked to Bob Dole. And I, I think Bob Dole had an interest in keeping me out of Kansas, to be honest with you. But, that, but the secondary motive was, is that we got along well in agriculture. And so those relationships, as long as you keep them good, they, they, can, they can keep you successful. And so I, I tell people the most important thing is don't burn your bridges. Even if you have an adversary that you're fighting on a big political issue or a legislative issue, after it's over, forget it, because you're going to need that person in the next battle. Um, and then when you went into the, um, the job as U.S. Secretary, um, you found yourself as, as the... <laughs> In the in the receiving end of some you know assaults, I, I mean some real uh, crazy attacks on you. I wonder if you can talk about that, not just in terms of what happened to you and how you used humor to protect yourself from it, but also why were people so angry at you? Well, I, what I found is is that people care very much about food, and I, you know the Secretary of Commerce wasn't getting pies thrown at him all the time. I had a tofu cream pie thrown at me by a lady that called me a pimp for the meat industry, and uh, and it missed it threw it at me, missed me, and hit Donna Shalala, Secretary Shalala, on the back. And I remember I looked at Bob Dole, who was with us at the time, and I said, "Bob, I don't think we're in Kansas any longer." And then I had uh, a uh, woman who threw infected buffalo guts at me in Montana because she thought I was poisoning her her family animals. And then the most interesting one was at the World Food Pro Summit in Rome. I had a bunch of protesters who stripped naked and threw genetically modified seeds at me and written on their bodies. I, of course, I didn't look, but written on their bodies was the naked truth and no gene beans. And the story I tell was uh, uh, one is dangerous to be secretary of agriculture. And two, when I talked to your grandparents that night, it had been on CNN, this story about the throwing the protesters. So your grandmother got on and she says, this is a dangerous job. You need to get out of this job. It's worse than being in, a, in the Defense Department. And then she says, just a minute, your father wants to talk to you. And he, so my, your grandfather got on the phone and says, tell me, what did it look like? So it was a, kind of the, the story. <laughs> and I tell that story a lot. Uh, there are other things that happened to me uh, with food. Uh, you know, it's like... Um, it was very interesting. We had the lowest uh, uh, pork prices in history during the time I was uh, secretary. And so, you know, while I don't make it a habit of eating pork, although I have uh, deviated from that once in a while on occasion, but uh, President uh, Clinton used to say, what a country it is that uh, we could have a Jewish secretary of agriculture promoting the pork industry. And uh, I got a kick out of that as well. So all these things kind of added up to, to using these experiences and using stories to let people know that, you know, the job could be fun as well. Well, I think that nothing exemplifies uh, telling stories and having fun and being self-deprecating more than the moment where you were almost the most powerful man in the entire world. If you can tell that story uh, to the crowd, I've certainly heard it and I'll pretend like I've never heard it before, I promise. But um, if you can tell the story about how you were the designated survivor at the State of the Union. So every State of the Union message, uh, they have one cabinet member stays away, the designated survivor in the event that the place blows up. And of course, ABC did a television show about this with Kiefer Sutherland. So. Uh, they usually pick the Secretary of Agriculture or Interior, 
or commerce. They would never pick the Secretary of uh, State or the, the Secretary of Defense. I used to tell people that was because the Secretary of Agriculture was the most important cabinet job. And that's why they picked me because if we didn't have food, then we would all die anyway. So that year I went up to New York, the military took me up there in their plane. Uh, and I had a secret service and they, uh, I assumed the guy was carrying the nuclear codes and military guy. And I went, went to visit your sister, Amy, who lives in, lived in New York in lower Manhattan. And we went to her apartment where I watched President Clinton give his speech. And as soon as his speech was over, um, uh, then they, he went back to the White House and then they didn't need me as designated survivor anymore. So I took Amy out to dinner that night and uh, it was in January of 1977, big, huge sleet storm came out. We got out of the restaurant about midnight. There was no such thing as Uber or Lyft or even cabs at that time. And so Amy and I walked back about 13 blocks back to her apartment. And I commented, I said, you know, three and a half hours ago, I was conceivably the most powerful man on the face of the earth. And we can't even get a cab today. And it's, I tell that story because it's a great story about resilience. The one day you can be down, the next day you can be up. It's like the old Frank Sinatra song, That's Life. I've been a poet, a pauper, a pawn, and a king. And so I, I, I try, graduations and other places, I tell the story. I said, you may that be down today, but it doesn't mean you're going to be down tomorrow. More importantly, you may be up today. It doesn't mean you're going to be up forever. Um, you know, there's two, I want to make sure because we have uh, only 15 minutes left and I've gotten a lot of questions and I think we could divide them into two categories. And unfortunately for you, they're extremely difficult questions, but it'll give me pleasure to give you these. Um, and let's see how self-deprecating you can be about these. Um, so the first one is, the first category is uh, either how do we fix the tone in politics or more, you know, to the, to the most extreme of these questions, how do we fix democracy or is democracy over? Well, first of all, it's a good question. Democracy is not over, but I tell you the last six to months to a year with the insurrection in the Capitol and with the way uh, uh, so many uh, members of Congress, mostly Republicans voted against certifying the election of Joe Biden does really show you that our democracy is in trouble. And uh, there are no magic answers, but uh, 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 part of it is just good, strong leadership that's fact-based. Part of it is getting rid of um, uh, gerrymandering um, because gerrymandering tends to produce members of Congress who are only in like-minded districts. It's not, they're not diverse districts where people of both parties. I had to play the center because I represented a district that had both Republicans and Democrats. Today, most of the districts are drawn either pure Democrat or pure Republican districts. And it's not a place where you, it, it encourages reasonable behavior, which is certainly part of it. The nature of our media today, you know, uh, again, not being nostalgic, but I grew up when there was local newspapers were really important and you had three television stations. And today people generally watch the news that agrees with them. So um, hardly any liberal will watch Fox and hardly any conservative will watch MSNBC. And I'm not telling you they ought to do it on a routine basis, but all these things contribute to this toxic tone that we have. And, you know, I'm not Pollyannish about it. It's just going to take the American people to, you know, Pogo said we have met the enemy and he is us. As, as bad as Trump was, a lot of these issues existed before Trump became president. And um, we just uh, gonna have to continue to work on these problems systematically. And because there is a systemic problem impacting our democracy right now, there's no question about it. Well, let's talk about systemic. You know, um, I did some research and just, you know, for the crowd, I, I, this is a common conversation I have uh, with my father is what's, it's one thing to say, hey, Americans should start watching others. It seems like we have to put in some systems to, to correct ourselves. And I noticed that in 1996, in the 96th Congress, the average age of a congressman was 48 years old. Today, that average age of a congressman is 59. The average age of a senator was 51. And today, the average age of a senator is 60. And when a young upstart ran for Congress in the 4th District, he ran saying that he was going to serve five terms at most. Now, of course, yeah, you went on to serve uh, more than five. 
But I'm, I'm wondering if term limits actually may be a solution to this so that there aren't these professional politicians who are continuing concerned about the next election and the next race. If they know there is an end date and you know expiration date to their time of serving, would that make a difference in your opinion? The, the problem with term limits is, is that congressional staff become the drivers of policy because you'd have to put term limits on staff as well uh, in order to uh, uh, make the system resilient. I, you know, I, I'm, we have, of course, term limits on presidents. Thank goodness, uh, in some cases, we've had that. Term limits may be part of the answer. Um, I also think getting rid of the Electoral College may be part of the answer because we have more and more states that are putting on these crazy rules on voting and voter suppression. And, you know, the Electoral College may have made sense in 1787. But we don't. We ought to elect our president at large. We have the United States Senate to protect small states. And I, what I worry about is the same thing that's happening now in Arizona, where people are challenging the elections in that state and the Electoral College. And remember when Trump says all I need is 12,781 more votes in the state of Georgia and what we saw there. So that's a, that's a, another you know kind of systemic or, or a structural answer. One positive thing is you know I worked at the Aspen Institute the last uh, ten years, and I worked with members of Congress. And I, what I found is a lot of the younger members of Congress, the newer members of Congress, because there's been a lot of turnover in the last five years or so, they're actually as good as anybody I ever served with back in the 1970s. Um, you know, you mentioned, we talked about your old race and somebody asked a question early on, which is how can somebody run for office without having to have a huge amount of money and win? Is there any way that we can remove the influx of money in politics? And do you think that would make a difference in the town? Uh, I think it would make a difference, but I so think what we saw in the last election is in some sense, big money was replaced by huge quantities of small money. So the internet has allowed people to raise money differently than they did before. I think the jury's out. History will prove which way is better or worse for democracy. I mean, I think this dark, hidden, undisclosed money is unhealthy. We raise too much money. As I mentioned before, I spent $100,000 on my first race, which allowed me to spend virtually all my time walking door to door and meeting constituents. And, you know, when you raise money, you don't kick the person in the rear end after you get a check from that person. You know, it's just a fact of life that you you owe them for what they've done to you. Um, OK, just to switch topics to something even harder to talk about, probably or more um, not to talk about, but probably more critical at this moment or equally critical is there's a lot of questions about America's relationship with Israel that we're getting. And my question for you is, um, you've had a lot of background and visits with Israel and Israeli leaders, um, you know, even with the, the Begin Sadat Carter uh, summit all the way back then. Um, are we at an inflection point in this country right now with our relationship with Israel? And is there anything that can be done to improve our relationship, especially when you see the demographics of young Jewish people and where they stand on the state of Israel? Well, I will say this, the support for Israel has become much more partisan than it used to be. So, you know, even as recently as 10, 15, 20 years ago, Democrat and Republican support for Israel was strong across the board. And, um, you know, recent, not too long ago, and remember the Speaker of the House invited Netanyahu to a joint session of Congress without telling the President of the United States he was going to do that. And it became a very partisan thing where all the Republicans cheered and the Democrats thought that the Republicans were use, was using Israel as a, as a partisan thing. I think support for Israel is still strong, but among younger voters and particularly among more progressive Democrats, there are more and more questions being asked about uh, what Israel is doing and how much we should be supporting them and what's the role of a Palestinian state and how we, how, how, how we get to uh, some sort of peace agreement with Israel. But right now, look, I think the support for Israel remains very strong. I don't see any evidence the United States is going to disassociate itself from Israel. But I do see that in politics today, there is a waning of the unconditional support for Israel, no matter what it does. And that's why, from a personal perspective, I was glad to see a change in Israeli leadership. And I don't think that change is going to necessarily mean 
uh, revolutionary change in Israeli policy. But I think Netanyahu had been in long enough, 12 years plus previous two years. It's, it's the same thing as term limits. It's time for new thinking. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. Um, okay, I'm going to end with three quick questions. So if you can answer, uh, you know, uh, within, let's say, 30 seconds or a minute. Um, one of the great stories I remember you telling, you, you know, you, you had the opportunity of seeing uh, the play Hamilton before most people happen to see, and I know you just sort of wandered into the theater and saw it in, off Broadway. Um, you know, there's a great song in the show Hamilton called In the Room Where It Happened. Can you give one example where you were in the room where it happened that all of us would have been dying to be in there? Uh, well, this is slightly controversial, but I was in the cabinet room after President Clinton uh, had his problems and issues with uh, Monica Lewinsky. And he came into the cabinet room after he had said, I did not have sex with that woman. He came in the cabinet room and and uh, told us uh, that uh, he didn't have a relationship. And then later on, we had what I call the highest price group therapy session in the history of the United uh -huh. States of America, where the president met with all of his cabinet. I was in the room and, and all of the senior advisors and basically not only apologized, but let everybody said what they thought about him in that process. And one member of the cabinet, a, a one of the leading, uh, I won't say who it was, but uh, 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 female members just took him to shreds for what he did, just right in front of the rest of us. He, she said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. And I'm thinking, you know, it's pretty hard to say to a president of the United States. And he didn't fire her and she stayed on. And so that I, I still remember that being in the room. Um, okay, we didn't get a talk, chance to talk about the Motion Picture Association job, but I do know that movies were so important to us growing up. Uh, we used to see drive-in movies in Wichita. We went to movies every election day. I'm wondering if there's one particular movie that uh, kind of perhaps changed your thinking or sort of guided the way you've behaved for the rest of your life. You know, I don't think there was one movie, and of course, you ended up in this business and an actual production career. And I think in part because we just went to movies all the time and we talk about them and we talk about them almost like it was like it actually happened. And of course the movies we talked most about were Godfather One and Godfather Two. And we used to relive the scenes, uh, you, me, your sister, your mother and our, our dogs became <laughs> part of the scenes as well. And, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say that that movie set any great moral things in my life in terms of the change, but I think it's probably when people ask me, what's the greatest movie I've ever seen? I say, I would say the two first Godfather movies were still the best. There are a lot of other guns. Animal House. I know that that's not a great movie, but it was a movie of my generation and, and you know, in my fraternity. And there are a lot of other good ones that I've seen, but I still think Godfather is the one. I'm kind of shocked you didn't mention any of my movies, but we'll get past that. That's a different therapy session. Yes. Um, so I, I want to close. You know, I saw a Moment magazine uh, there. They are asking people for their best Jewish joke. I'm not going to put you on the spot to say what your best Jewish joke is, but I do want you to close with a story about your mother and you meeting with uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, 41, and uh, the story uh, when she first met him. So I took my mother to the congressional picnic that we'd have every year. Uh, and this year it was the first George Bush, the first wonderful man. And so I, and he knew all the members of Congress. He, he used to come down You talk about uh, bipartisanship. He used to come down and play racquetball in the house of representatives gym once a week to build relationships with Congress. And so I met, I saw him and I came up to him and I said, Mr. President, I'd like you to meet my mother, Gladys Glickman. And he, the president looks at her and he says, we just love your son. We just wish he would convert. And of course he meant from uh, Democrat to Republican. And my mother without missing the beat says, Mr. President, we like being Jewish. Okay. And uh, I, I used to see the president on occasion and he says, is your mother still upset with me? And I said, no. He, he said, we, I won't try to convert you anymore. <laughs> um, okay, well, that's a good note to end on. Suzanne, I don't know if you're there. Um, there you are. Um, thank you, Suzanne, for letting us talk. And uh, 
and uh, I throw it to you. Yes, thank you both. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, John. That was a wonderful conversation. We really appreciate you giving us a small window into your family and your life's work. Um, I want to remind everybody that they can use the links that are in the chat to purchase the book, Laughing at Myself. Um, we will be sending a follow-up email, and I will include the links in that as well. Um, and also, please remember to visit Moment's website at momentmag.com. Um, as, as John mentioned, we do have this great new symposium on Jewish jokes from lots of different people. You'll really enjoy that. Uh, and please register for next week's Moment Zoominar uh, on women resistance fighters during the Holocaust. Uh, again, Dan, John, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to the audience, and we'll see you next week. Take care. Thank you.